Welcome to Law Sessions. I am Jennifer Housen. In this session, I will introduce you to land law. Now, this introduction is not the typical God got it sorted in six days type of introduction. We are simply going to see what land law is about and it certainly is not the sort of introduction that gives you the long-winded approach that you generally get from most law books. I will leave it to those law books for you to look at. What I want to do in this introduction is to gently lead you into what land law is about, what it covers, and generally to let you know what it is we will be doing in the next several sessions that carry on from this. Certainly, we will start off with just basically what land covers, but in the following lectures, we will look at, for example, the distinction between unregistered and registered land conveyancing for a start. We will look at leases and licenses. We will look at easements. We will certainly look at adverse possession, mortgages, freehold covenants and leasehold covenants. The idea then is to introduce you to the topics that we will be looking at over the entire series, as well as to start you in a grounding of what I consider to be a terribly exciting subject. You may disagree initially, but certainly at the end of the, not only this session, but at the end of the entire series, hopefully you will feel slightly differently if you have any apprehensions at this moment whatsoever. The thing is that land law tends to have this reputation of being a very dry topic area. Now, it is something that I personally love, not uh, simply because it is one of the few subjects that I actually gained a first class mark in on my degree, but I think that it is a subject that once you get the grasp of it, it will allow you to understand other subjects like, for example, trust or indeed company law and other types of areas which include property as their base. So let's see how well I can impart it to you. And as I said, this will be a somewhat short lecture over this next 40 minutes or so. And I will take you through a brief introduction and review some general principles. Okay, theoretically, if we go back to not necessarily, as I say, the beginning of biblical times, but if we go back to where we can look at land law in in the context of how it was owned in England and Wales. The first thing to consider is that all land belongs to the crown and the only person capable of owning land, and that's an important term of art, owning land, the only person capable of owning land is the monarch. And this dates back to the Norman conquest of 1066 and it still exists today. What the person in England and Wales owns is not land, but rather a series of rights and duties in relation to a particular piece of land. Now, the concept of sub infidation had emerged after the Norman Conquest and represented the reward that the king gave to those who supported him. So, for example, the king would give out parcels of land in return for services to the crown. So, for example, the king would give a lord, say, 1,500 acres of land in Birmingham. And in return, what that lord would do is to supply the king for as long as the king wished with 30 fully equipped mounted soldiers when necessary, for argument's sake. Now, the name of the interest was an estate in land, and the condition under which the lord held was called tenure. So tenure looked at the terms on which the land was held and estate looked at how long the land was held. Now then, the Lord has this 1,500 acres of land. He would then maybe give his manservant the use of 250 acres of land of that 1,500 acres. Now in return for that, the manservant working on the land for him and saying prayers for him three times per week to absolve the Lord of his sins, perhaps, the manservant then would also hold an estate in land granted to him. Again, 
it would be subject to the conditions of tenure, which would have been determined by the Lord. Now, this could go on and on and on and on with different types of tenure, depending on the service given as each intermediary would grant an interest in land for some type of service and the whole fabric of feudalism was created. However, with the end of the feudal system, that principle of tenure is of little significance today. Albeit of little significance though, doesn't mean that you don't need to have some understanding of it, even on an overview, general approach of it. What it does is that it gives you an understanding of the history. Example, why the words like estate are used today. Now, the only two estates by which land can be held in England and Wales today are a freehold estate and a leasehold estate. Now, by and large, the freehold estate and the leasehold estate are such that they have been created in this framework of what you understand estates to be. Now, in most Commonwealth countries, there is a somewhat similar system and there have been amendments and alterations somewhat in these Commonwealth system, but by and large, it remains the same. That historically, what you had was a feudal system of tenure and the tenure as I uh, stated, could go on and on forever. Nowadays, though, what we have is the freehold estate and the leasehold estate. The freehold estate is, of course, the best estate that you can have. The leasehold estate, not necessarily so, because it generally has a cap on the period of time that you can hold for. Now, the freehold estate, of course, as we will see in the second segment of this lecture, will certainly show you the best interest that a person can have. But that said, I want to reiterate that the fact the crown is the only person who can own land, the freehold estate is as close to owning land as you're possibly going to get. What we're going to do now on that very brief introduction is we're going to pause and then as I come back after the break we will look at freehold estate and leasehold estates in a more fleshed out format. 